Kia ora koutou, uh, ko e au e tu a kenei, ko kapa katou maha ka te mauka, ko ofi o te awa, ko komo te waka, ko tangata titi te iwi, uh, ko Grant Brooks toka ingoa. Uh, no o te pote ahau. Um, greetings everyone, I'm Grant, originally hailing from o te pote Dunedin, where I joined ISO in 1993. Um, but it wasn't until I moved up to Tamaki Makaurau in 1997 that I really got to grips with Pacific politics, and that's what I'll be talking about tonight. So I'm going to start with um, a bit of cringe and hold your nose, people, because I'm going to just share. For Lahiatu. Well, I'm here in Nui. And what's the reason? Well, the Pacific is our family, and being here is a great opportunity to reaffirm New Zealand's position as a close and trusted partner. So what? Right, that's enough of that. <laughs> but that um, little soundbite from uh, Chris Luxon expresses and encapsulates what the official version of New Zealand's relationship to the Pacific is. Pacific is our family, and New Zealand is a close and trusted partner. This official story is a myth. Closer to this truth is, a, is the view recently given in an interview uh, with the Green Party spokesperson for Pacific Affairs, Tayano Tuiano, when he said, the relationship with New Zealand and the Pacific has been a problematic one. New Zealand has used the Pacific as a place to extract resources or to bring in cheap labour. So that relationship is part of our history. A vision of New Zealand as a launching pad for Western imperialism in the Pacific was present in the minds of the British colonisers from the very early arrival in Aotearoa. And there's a really good summary of it here from Radio New Zealand, just for the first minute. Us New Zealanders like to think of ourselves as a pretty relaxed bunch by global standards. We're just sitting here in our quiet, isolated islands, far away from the world's great geopolitical conflicts. But that isn't the case. In the context of the Pacific, Aotearoa is a big player. And if our 19th century administrators and politicians had had their way, it could have been a lot bigger. During the 19th century, New Zealand's leaders had a vision of a massive Pacific empire and dreamed of controlling places as far apart as Fiji, Hawaii and Rapa Nui. And parts of that dream came true, although for some it was more like a nightmare. By the that um, little sh um, podcast or, or video is, is really worth watching uh, in its entirety, but I'm just going to leave it there because it gives you the, the image in your mind. So in a speech to the British House of Commons in 1845, Charles Buller, who was a member of parliament and also a director of the New Zealand Company, declared a British colony in New Zealand would be the natural master of this ocean. You might make it in truth the Britain of the Southern Hemisphere. There you might concentrate the trade of the Pacific, and from that new seat of your dominion, you might give laws and manners to the new world. And as we've just seen in that opening clip from uh, Radio New Zealand, successive 19th century politicians, from Governor George Grey to Premiers Julius Vogel, Robert Stout and Richard Seddon, all petitioned the Colonial Office in London to turn this vision into a reality and to annex a host of Pacific nations, including Fiji, Tonga, Samoa, New Hebrides, as it was called then, Vanuatu, and even invade French-controlled territories. But the New Zealand politicians met with little success because British imperialists were more focused at that time on protecting their existing empire from European rivals and indigenous revolts. So growing dissatisfied with London's reluctance, attention turned to imposing direct rule from Wellington on Britain's behalf. In 1901, the New Zealand government assumed control over the Cook Islands and the location of Christopher Luxon's recent myth-making, Niue. This was followed by the military invasion of Western Samoa in 1914 and control of Nauru in 1923 in partnership with Australia and the UK and then control of Tokelau. And direct rule from Wellington didn't actually end until the election of the first Tokoloan head of government in 1993. But any suggestion that New Zealand's Pacific imperialism is no more than a part of history would be mistaken. Military intervention and New Zealand imperialism in the Pacific 
now in partnership with Australia and the, and the United States instead of Britain, has continued unabated into the 21st century. In 1997, New Zealand troops were dispatched to Bougainville as a truce monitoring group, marking the end of a nine-year war between the Bougainville Revolutionary Army and the government of Papua New Guinea. The tr New Zealand troops famously landed on the island armed only with guitars. There's a documentary about that, uh, Soldiers Without Guns. Many of the personnel involved still have visit vivid memories of helping Bougainville's people. But whatever the personal motivations of individual soldiers, they were being used to serve New Zealand government interests. The official story of Bougainville portrays New Zealand's, New Zealand's intervention as serving the people, a majority of whom longed for peace. Papua New Guinea forces had killed 12,000 Bougainvillians out of a population of 160,000. A third of the people were driven from their homes. But Bougainvillians also wanted independence and an end to the environmental destruction caused by the huge Panguna copper mine on the island. The Panguna mine was jointly owned by the PNG government and Australian multinational corporation Rio Tinto. Opening in 1972, the mine generated billions of dollars for Rio Tinto and provided the PNG government with a fifth of its income. Only 1% of the profit went back to the people of Bougainville. Meanwhile, more than a billion tonnes of toxic tailings from the mine, contaminated with waste, were dumped in the rivers, killing fish, birds and other animals. Tribal lands, homes to the spirits of ancestors, were desecrated. Australia opposed independence for Bougainville and backed the PNG government's war against its people. They funded the PNG military and supplied them with training, ammunition, aircraft, weapons and even personnel. Phosphorus incendiary munitions, which were dropped on villages in 1994, were supplied by Australia. And phosphorus, as you may know, is a weapon of indiscriminate terror, which sticks to various surfaces, including skin, and burns at temperatures of 800 to 2500 degrees Celsius. Its use against civilian targets is banned under international law. Now, unsurprisingly, the Bougainville Revolutionary Army refused to allow Australian troops onto the island to monitor the truce. The president of the Bougainville Interim Government, who was also the uh, leader of the Bougainville Revolutionary Army, said Australia is clearly not neutral because it was a major party to the nine-year war on Bougainville. This is him here, uh, pictured at the bottom left, <laughs> Francis Ona, uh, the uh, interim president of the uh, president of the interim government looking over the devastation caused by the Panguna mine. Francis Ona went on to say that the Australian government's real interest is to allow the safe return of, to Rio Tinto to mining the Panguna mine. Yet five months after the New Zealand troops arrived, in April of 1998, Australian troops were landing on Bougainville, pictured there on the bottom right and New Zealand was handing over command of the operation to Brigadier Bruce Osborne of the Australian Army. The legal advisor to the Bougainville Interim Government, Ruben Ciara, said New Zealand had to get involved at the outset to open the door for Australia. The 1997 peace agreement, which the New Zealand troops were sent to monitor, included a promise of a referendum on Bougainville's independence. It took 22 more years for that referendum to be held, and despite 97% voting in favour of independence in 2019, the PNG government has so far refused to accept the result, and despite a long-running claim for compensation, no money has been paid by Rio Tinto for the environmental destruction. New Zealand's military intervention in Bougainville has ensured, above all, that Western imperial interests are protected. In 1999, just two years later, New Zealand troops deployed to East Timor as part of a UN operation led again by Australia. The territory had been under a brutal Indonesian occupation since 1975. That's um, the island of Timor just, to the, just above and to the left of the pink area, which I'll get to in a minute. 
And Indonesia, as you can see, is right next door. Um, invaded in 1975, and they launched a t they launched an invasion to crush Timorese independence. Elections in the former Portuguese colony of Timor in 1975 had delivered victory to the Frente Revolucionare de Timor Leste Independente, Independente, or the Revolutionary Front of Independent East Timor, known by its acronym Fretilin. Indonesia's military dictator, President Suharto, ordered the invasion due to Cold War fears about the spread of communism, along with the discovery of oil and gas reserves in the seabed between East Timor and Australia, marked in the pink and yellow and orange on the map. Amnesty International estimates that up to 200,000 Timorese people, a quarter of the population, were subsequently killed during Indonesia's 24-year occupation. Declassified documents have shown that the United States and Australia fully supported Indonesia's invasion, and the reason for the time, at the, reason at, at the time is on the public record. In 1973, the Australian politician Justin O'Byrne salivated in a speech to the Senate about East Timor's, quote, gas and oil in quantities that could match even the fabulous riches of the Middle East. The New Zealand government also supported Indonesia's invasion. De there's a declassified telegram sent in 1975 by Frank Corner, who was the New Zealand Secretary of Foreign Affairs, to the New Zealand Embassy in Australia, and it said, the government had a private and a public position on the problem. Privately, we recognised integration with Indonesia. The government couldn't state this openly, however, and it stressed that the wishes of the Timorese people were the fundamental factor. Throughout the 1980s and 90s, Western government's support for the initial invasion extended to Indonesia's ongoing occupation. The change in policy came in 1998, because the previous year, Indonesia's President Suharto had been overthrown by a popular revolution. The new reformist government was open to greater autonomy for East Timor. Australia's right-wing Prime Minister John Howard saw the opportunity to cut out the middleman and bully a fledgling government in an independent East Timor to grab a slice of the resources for Australia. And with thousands of Australian troops on the ground effectively holding the new Fretland government hostage, John Howard got his way. Because on 20th of May 2002, the very first day of formal independence for the Democratic Republic of Timor-Leste, the Timor Sea Treaty was signed, granting billions of dollars worth of reserves to Australia and assuring Australian control over all exploration and processing of oil and gas in the Joint Petroleum Development Area, marked there in yellow. Sorry, marked there in pink. The uh, yellow is the Australian stuff. Pink is the Joint Development Area, which Australia controlled. Now, the official account of New Zealand's deployment to East Timor tells of the troops defending the Timorese people from rogue Indonesian militia who were opposed to independence in 1999. But John Pilger, investigative journalist, said at the time, the real agenda for the UN peacekeeping force is to ensure that East Timor, while nominally independent, remains under the sway of Jakarta and Western business interests. Impoverished by decades of occupation and settled, settled with an unfavourable oil treaty, the new nation state of East Timor, of Timor-Leste, was desperately poor. Wages in the country were capped at US $3 a day, and the UN reported that half the population were living on 55 cents a day or less. In 2000, the year after the New Zealand troops arrived, President Janana Gujmao warned that East Timor's underpaid soldiers led an impoverished, subhuman existence and might eventually revolt. In 2006, uh, Gujmao's prediction came to pass. New Zealand troops returned to East Timor, to Timor-Leste, as it was known then, again under Australian command. And the uprising against the uprising of the, of the uh, Timorese soldiers was suppressed. Fretland Prime Minister Mari Al Qatari, who at the time was courting Chinese investment to build up oil and gas processing facilities on Timor Leste, uh, in competition with the Australians, was forced to resign, and a new government more compliant with Western imperialism was installed. In two thousand and three. Moving on, New Zealand troops landed in Honiara, the capital of the Solomon Islands. 
The official mis mission of the Australian Air Force was to restore order. Five years of inter-ethnic conflict in the Solomons had cost more than 100 lives, and around 40,000 people had been driven from their homes. The New Zealand soldiers would stay on for a decade and return again after that. A bit of background here. Prior to the 1880s, the Solomon Islands were a collection of separate, self-governing um, islands. In 1883, they were colonised by Germany and Britain, forcing disparate ethnic groups with different languages and different customs into a single European-created nation. Ethnic tensions created by colonisation were further heightened by the US occupation of the Solomons during World War II, when they shifted the nation's capital from the island of Malaita to the neighbouring island of Guadalcanal. Uh, Guadalcanal is known as Isitabu in the uh, indigenous language of the people there. American demand for labour during World War II also drew, drove mass migration from Malaitans to the new capital, putting pressure on land held by Isitabu people. On Guadalcanal, women have primary rights to land. On Malaita, it's the men. So over time, Malaitan men married Guadalcanal women, gaining land rights on their island. When the 1998 Asian economic crisis threw thousands out of work, simmering ethnic tensions boiled over. The Isatabu Freedom Movement launched attacks on Malaitan migrants, and the Malaitan Eagle Force took up arms in response. Announcing the New Zealand military deployment in 2003, Foreign Minister Phil Goff labelled the Solomons a failed state which needed outside intervention from Australia and New Zealand. But the real reasons for the intervention were plainly stated in a report titled Our Failing Neighbour, published in 2003 by the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. Firstly, said the report, Australia's standing in the wider world, including with the United States, is at stake. New Zealand agreed, with Foreign Minister Winston Peters commenting in 2006 that, quote, New Zealand's involvement in the Solomon Islands and Timor-Leste are good examples of where our international contribution coincides with American interests. Secondly, according to the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, quote, the collapse of Solomon Islands is depriving Australian businesses of, in of investment opportunities. So, in 1998, the Australian multinational Delta Gold had opened a huge mine on Guadalcanal. The lucrative mine accounted for a quarter of the Solomon Islands economy, but the benefits didn't flow to the local people. The extreme inequality in the Solomons meant that in 2003, 1% of households were receiving 52% of all income. Australian intervention, of course, was not intended to change this. It was to get the gold mine seized by Guadalcanal militants in 2000, back under Australian management. The mine did reopen under new Australian owners, and two years later, the last New Zealand and Australian troops left, only to return again in 2021. If you're detecting a pattern here, it's because there is one. In 2006, New Zealand and Australian troops were sent to the Kingdom of Tonga, again to restore order. Tonga was a deeply unequal society dominated by the king and his nobles. Of the 33 MPs in the Tongan parliament, 14 were appointed by the king for life, and nine more by the 33 members of the country's nobility. Only nine were actually elected by the people, who were dubbed commoners. The royal, Tongan royal family used their power to amass huge personal fortunes in offshore bank accounts in collaboration with international capitalists. The Tongan king made 26 million US dollars selling Tongan passports, uh, mainly to Hong Kong residents ahead of the territory's transfer back to China in 1997. Forbes magazine put the wealth of his daughter, Princess Pilolevu, at over US 30 million dollars. Meanwhile, average income in Tonga in 2005 was less than 40 dollars a week. That same year, mass protests demanding democracy saw a tenth of the total population take to the streets. A six-week strike by public sector workers demanded pay rises of 60 to 80 percent, and a royal commission to be established immediately to, quote, review the constitution to allow a more democratic government to be established. The 2005 general election had delivered seven of the nine directly elected seats 
to the Human Rights and Democracy Movement, headed by uh, MP Akalisi Pohiva. When, King, when, the, when the King died in September 2006, and his unpopular son, Prince George Tupo V, was named as his successor, popular anger boiled over into riots. Troops arrived from Australia and New Zealand to enforce martial law. Foreign Minister Winston Peters said, quote, our presence is not about taking sides. New Zealand has been fully supportive of peaceful democratic reform in Tonga. But Akalisi Pohiva, who was leading the Human Rights and Democracy Party, said he condemned the foreign intervention. And the chair of the National Committee for Political Reform, Dr. Sedevini Halapua, said the foreign troops were there to, quote, make people afraid and support the government. Once New Zealand and Australian troops had restored order, Akalisi and other pro-democracy MPs were arrested and charged with sedition. This is Akalisi Pohiva up there on the top right. The pressure for change in Tonga was unstoppable, but the revolutionary potential of 2006 was blunted by the New Zealand military, so that when democratic reform eventually arrived, four years later, the wealthy and powerful were protected. The net worth of today's reigning king in Tonga, Tupo VI, is US $100 million. While direct military intervention is the most visible expression of New Zealand's imperialism in the Pacific, it's only the tip of the spear. Behind the use of armed force is diplomatic pressure and the wielding of economic power over Pacific nations, including through aid programs, which always have strings attached. Aid conditions usually include requirements for Pacific governments to implement policies favourable to Western business interests. Sometimes they require aid recipients to spend the money on goods and services from the donor country. This so-called boomerang aid, which mainly benefits Western businesses back in the donor country, has long been a feature of Australian foreign policy and is now part of New Zealand's approach as well. One clear example of New Zealand's economic imperialism is the Pacific Agreement on Closer Economic Relations, called PACER, and the resulting multilateral free trade agreement known as PACER Plus. PACER began as an attempt to sabotage the Pacific Island countries' trade agreement, which was a Pacific-led initiative launched in 2001 to expand trade in goods and services among the 14 members of the Pacific Island Forum, excluding Australia and New Zealand. The sabotage was successful. Pressure was applied by New Zealand and Australia to Pacific nations not to ratify the deal, and PICTA never came into force. The PACER Plus uh, free trade deal came into effect in 2020. Officials at New Zealand's Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade say that the deal will boost sustainable economic development and contribute to a more stable and resilient Pacific region. But independent analyses found that the removal of import tariffs will deprive Pacific nations of around 60 million US dollars each year in government revenue, that it will cost 75% of Pacific manufacturing jobs and have negative health impacts due to an increase in the imports of cheap, unhealthy foods from New Zealand in particular, as well as threats to healthy, cultural, culturally appropriate food production. I'm not sure if people are aware about the kind of food that gets exported from New Zealand to the Pacific. It's the offcuts that New Zealanders won't eat that are, that are um, sent there. And it, this PESA Plus deal, one of its aims was to make, that, uh, make the access for those goods uh, easier. The real aims, which are also touted by the Foreign Affairs and Trade, say that PESA Plus will improve market access for New Zealand businesses. It will provide greater consistency, says MFAT, certainty and transparency, trading in the Pacific region, and, quote, generate opportunities to invest or partner with Pacific businesses. A, pet a petition signed by 171 prominent individuals and 33 organisations in the region, including the Australian Council of Trade Unions and the New Zealand Council of Trade Unions, called on Pacific governments not to sign. Unfortunately, they did. Imperialist expansion and domination of the Pacific has been a feature of New Zealand's foreign policy since the earlier stages of colonisation. It's not the result of decisions taken by this politician or that political party. 
As Marxists like Vladimir Lenin and Nikolai Bukharin pointed out over a century ago, imperialism is an inevitable product of capitalism. Summarizing their work, uh, US socialist Brian Jones writes, quote, capitalism in its classic phase was characterized by competing commodity producing firms within unified national markets. Bukharin and Lenin set out to show, however, that the era of small business competition necessarily led to the creation of giant trusts and cartels. What is a trust or a cartel for that matter? These are simply organizations within an industry or even across industries that form to confer the advantages of monopoly on their participants. Lenin uses the example of a German coal syndicate that came to dominate 87% 80 of coal output in its area in 1893 and 95% by 1910. There are countless modern examples. The worldwide media, for example, were controlled by 50 corporations worldwide in 1983, and by 2004, there remained only five. Their goal is to use the immense size to destroy their competition, not increase it. By means of buying political influence, underselling small producers, and so on, large enterprises systematically choke to death their smaller rivals. This concentration reached a point over 100 years ago where certain industries became fused with the national state. The national borders are too narrow for the growth of these industries, and they are compelled to constantly acquire new markets, new sources of raw material, and new outlets for investment outside of their home nation. And once the world was already carved up among world powers, they are forever pushed by market competition toward rearranging who owns what and have no other way to settle who gets what except by force. Thus, the era of imperialism of one of, is one of constant economic competition between states that breaks out again and again into open military competition. Each state may employ various policies, but imperialism is not reducible to a particular policy. The policies themselves must be seen as flowing from a worldwide system of imperialist competition. So says the US socialist Brian Jones. So this not only explains why New Zealand governments have always acted to suppress Pacific self-determination and to secure Western control of resources, but also why they whip up fear of Chinese influence in the Pacific and why they even sometimes criticize French colonialism. Liberation in the Pacific, first of all, requires that working people in Aotearoa see through the smokescreen of official lies about New Zealand's role as indeed the New Zealand Council of Trade Unions did when it called on Pacific governments not to sign up to pay surplus. But ultimately, however, liberation also requires the end of the capitalist system, which to varying degrees oppresses all of us in Samoa Nui Akira. Thank you.